now call this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who's come out for the meeting tonight and also those that are viewing the uh, meeting on G10 television. We're going to begin tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mayor Pro Tem Mike Lazara, followed by an invocation by our City Attorney John Carter. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we pause this evening, as always, to give you thanks. To give you thanks for this beautiful day you have gifted to us and for all the blessings and benefits that you bestow upon us individually and as residents of the city of Jacksonville. Tonight, we especially give thanks for the life and the service of Oliver Hill, who passed away last week not only for his service on the Onslow Civic Affairs Commission, but also for his passion. His passion as a mentor to African-American young males. He will be surely missed, and we pray for his family during this time of their loss. We pray for our men and women who are serving here and around the world for their safety and for their anxious families. And as always, give guidance and direction to our mayor and to our council. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I have a motion to adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting. So moved. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, we're going to do some presentations tonight. I'm going to come around front. You know, some life-saving awards tonight, and I would like to ask uh, the Director of Public Safety, uh, Mike Canero, to come forward, please. Chief? David. <clears throat> also, we'd like to have uh, officers from the Jacksonville P Police Department, William Cress Cressy, Daryl Nash, Scott Tamburo, and telecommunicator David Bledgey, and Jeffrey McAllister. If you'll join me up front. <clears throat> On Tuesday, November 22nd, 2016, Jacksonville Police responded to a report of a suicidal subject at a residence in the city. Uh, telecommunicator David Bledgey received the call and efficient, efficiently gathered the information necessary for telecommunicator Jeffrey McAllister to quickly dispatch officers. Officer Daryl Nash was the first officer to arrive at the scene. Observing the residence, Officer Nash saw a subject walking up a ladder into the attic and found the door unlocked. Officer William Cressy and Scott Tamburo uh, arrived on the scene and attempted to speak to the subject. Officers soon were able to see that the subject was not a threat but was hanging from an attic rafter. Officer Cressy and Tamboro uh, rushed up the ladder and lifted the subject while Officer Nash cut the rope. Officers carried the subject into the living room to assess his condition and the subject was breathing, breathing and slowly regaining consciousness. Onslow County EMS arrived to transport the subject to a medical facility. The quick and decisive action of these officers and telecommunicators is commendable. Their actions resulted in preventing a tragedy and are very worthy of the life-saving award. And it is with my pleasure and honor to be able to present this to them at this time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Very, very good work. All right, we have some other life-saving awards for tonight, and I would like to ask JPD Officer Bergman, Jacksonville Fire and Emergency Services Firefighter Brandon Barnett, and Driver Operator Dwayne Messner and Benjamin Frank, if you'd join me up front, please. On Wednesday, November 23rd, 2016, Officer Alan Bergman responded to a medical call at a residence in the city. Upon his arrival, Officer Bergman found a 32-year-old man on the floor unresponsive with unsteady, shallow breathing, a, a weak pulse, and skin coloration, discoloration. Recognizing the signs of an opi opioid overdose, Officer Bergman administered Narcan to the uh, victim. Shortly after Jacksonville Fire Emergency Services arrived on the scene, Firefighter Barnett assist, assessed the patient and found the patient had a weak pulse but was not breathing. Firefighter Barnett established an airway and driver operator Benjamin Frank ventilated the victim with a bag valve mask. Firefighter Barnett prepared a second dose of Narcan which was administered by Officer Bergman. At that time, the victim regained consciousness and admitted to the first responders that he had snorted a large amount of heroin. Driver operator Messner assisted with preparing the patient for transport by Onslow County EMS for medical treatment. The quick and decisive action of these first responders resulted in rev reviving the victim. Their actions resulted in the preventing of a tragedy and are worthy of the life-saving award. At this time, I'd like to ask Corporal James Smallwood to join me up front. Oh, your wife is here. I always see her. I've never met her. Come, <laughs> come on up and help us out here. How you doing? <laughs> well, thank you for coming out tonight. Corporal James L. Smallwood III of the Jacksonville Police Department recently completed the Traffic Enforcement and Investigation Certificate Program 
at the North Carolina Justice Academy in Salemburg, I take it. Uh, this program recognizes the achievement of law enforcement professionals who have dedicated themselves to making the highways safer for our citizens. Corporal Smallwood has exceeded the uh, five, 500 hour of traffic enforcement and investigation training required to successfully complete the program. James, thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. You're a good officer. <laughs> I didn't see Mike Ciccarelli come in. Did, did he come in? And I not see him? Okay. Uh, Char Rodriguez, if you'll join me up front, please. Okay, we got more people from the Red Cross. Okay. Might as well come on up and be on TV, huh? Might as well, yeah. yes. <laughs> I'm very pleased tonight to be able to uh, present this proclamation, um, recognizing March as American Red Cross Month in the city of Jacksonville. And if you'll indulge me a moment, I'll read this uh, proclamation. Whereas American Red Cross Month is a special time to recognize and thank our Red Cross volunteers and donors who give their time and resources to help community members, and whereas Red Cross volunteers and donors are community heroes. They help families find shelter, after a home fire, they give blood to help trauma victims and cancer patients. They deliver comfort items to military members in the hospital. They use their life-saving skills to save someone from heart attack, drowning, or choking. They enable children around the globe to be vaccinated against measles and rubella. And whereas across the country and around the world, the American Red Cross responds to disasters big and small, in fact, every eight minutes, the organization responds to a community disaster, providing shelter, food, emotional support, and other necessities to those affected. And whereas the American Red Cross collects nearly 40% of the nation's blood supply, provides 24-hour support to military members, veterans, and their families, teaches millions life-saving skills, such as lifeguarding and CPR, and through its Restoring Family Links program, connects family members separated by crisis, conflict, or migration. And whereas, we dedicate the month of March to those who support the American Red Cross mission to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies. Our community depends on the American Red Cross, which relies on donations of time, money, and blood to fulfill its humanitarian mission. Now, therefore, I, Sammy Phillips, the mayor of the city of Jacksonville, do hereby proudly proclaim March 2017 as American Red Cross Month in the city of Jacksonville. And I encourage all citizens to support this great organization and its noble humanitarian mission. And I will present you with this proclamation right now. Sure. Thank you. Did you Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council members. Thank you so much. It's always an opportunity to uh, proclaim the organization that we all love. You know, for over 100 years in Onslow County, volunteers have been getting up out of our cozy, comfort, comfortable homes and going out to help people that we don't know. We are looking for volunteers always. Uh, your financial support is always great. And right now, there's a critical blood shortage. So if you so desire, we'd appreciate you donating your blood. Give a gift that counts. Thank you. Thank you again, Thank you. Mayor. Thank you all for coming tonight.
I know a lot of you folks came here tonight for the uh, presentations and all, so we're going to take a brief pause in our meeting uh, before we take up uh, the rest of the business for the evening and uh, give you a chance to, to go ahead and leave if you wish. By all means, stay if you want, but uh, this will give you an opportunity to leave if uh, you want to. <laughs> You and the main. You have my towel. <laughs> okay, we have a um, section of public comments, um, but no one has signed up for it tonight. But I'll offer, as I usually do, to anyone who may have come in after the sheet was taken up, if you wish to uh, make some type of comment. Anybody? Seeing no one taking my offer there, we're going to move on to uh, the adoption of the minutes and consent items. We have some minutes from a January 24, 2017 special meeting, and we have those nine items on consent. Mayor Phillips, I'll move that we approve our January 24, 2017 special meeting minutes and also uh, approve the consent items uh, with a comment. I'd like to give um, some recognition to Representative Phil Shepard. If you look at item number seven and number eight, Carolina Forest Boulevard, the NCDOT contingency funding agreement, uh, and also the Sturgeon City Environmental Education Center, Representative Shepard uh, was a, um, a, a staunch supporter of these two programs and helped us fund helped us secure funding of four hundred thousand dollars, two hundred and fifty thousand for the Carolina Forest Boulevard and one hundred and fifty thousand for the Sturgeon City project. And um, so I just want to publicly thank him for his support of of our efforts in our community, and that uh, we appreciate all that he has done for us. And without further ado, I. I move that we approve the consent and the minutes. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion to second discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, it brings us to our first item. It's a public hearing. This will be item number 10 on your agenda for this evening. This is a public hearing on a unified development ordinance text amendment, an official zoning map amendment. Uh, and this is dealing with... Uh, the mural overlay districts and overlay districts and Ryan King, our planning and permitting administrator will be presenting this item. Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Council. Uh, item 10 before you, I combined into one agenda item. So there'll be two actions that will be needed. Uh, should city council decide to move forward. The first part will be the unified development ordinance text amendment. Uh, as you may recall, we presented in a workshop to city council, a proposal, to create a downtown mural program. And within the text amendment, we would revise our unified development ordinance in order to allow murals within the downtown area that falls within the overlay zone. So 
This would create that opportunity as we presented in the workshop. There's standards on how these murals would be applied to the buildings and basically a use would be created so that it would allow business owners the opportunity to have a mural on the building. Be happy to answer any questions that the um, City Council may have at this time. Uh, Ms. Cindy Edwards with the Arts Council was instrumental in the drafting of this language for the Unified Development Ordinance, and she may be available to answer questions as well. And the second part of this amendment would be to establish the areas, the areas in which our downtown zone, these murals could be located. So staff has identified the areas that are on the screen and found as an attachment to your agenda item. So only within these areas that you see with the, let's see, with the, the areas here, oops. Tell us where they're at. And then down near City Hall and then Sturgeon City. Gotcha. So those are the only locations where these murals could be placed as long as they meet all the other criteria. Be happy to answer any questions that the mayor and council may have at this time. Council, any questions of Mr. King? Just a quick one. I, I, for, I think it's the first time I've realized that Sturgeon City's in that area. What was, what was the thought process down there? I'm, I'm not aware of any buildings off the top of my head. Well, we thought the tower, oh, oh, the, the, uh, the tanks. The we whole, thought that the, yeah, tanks the tanks and or the bio tower may the present tanks. an opportunity. Sure, sure. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> thank you. Just a reminder, two actions for, okay, for this you. amendment. Thank yes, you. At this time, we're going to recess the regular council meeting up in a public hearing that's required in this matter. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this matter? If so, please indicate by raising your hand. And please state your name and address for the clerk, please. Cindy Edwards. My home address is 210 Linwood Drive, Jacksonville, 28546. I just want to say thank you to the City Council for um, going through this process with us and reviewing the options and being willing to entertain this. Um, the downtown area is a focus that's one of the city's primary goals right now, and for redevelopment to happen there, there have to be some aesthetic things that are part of that equation. So you've heard from me on the subject before. I won't belabor it, but just wanted to say thank you for giving this the attention that it needs so that we can make steps forward downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Anyone else? Well, that's I will close the uh, public hearing in this matter and reconvene the regular council meeting. Councilor, you're being asked to uh, con uh, consider the UDO text amendment and also uh, the official zoning map that's, that demarcates those areas, uh, those zones. Move to approve the UDO text amendment as found in attachment A and the uh, amendment to the official zoning map establishing the overlay zone as exhibited in attachment B. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any uh, discussion? No discussion. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Unanimous. We'll go to agenda item number 11. This is a public hearing on the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment. This is regarding... Uh, off-street parking, loading, and circulation for all, and uh, automated teller machines. And uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan King will be presenting this item. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Because we haven't presented this to City Council before tonight, I'll go into a little bit more depth and detail with this one as I did the previous item. This is an issue that has recently surfaced through um, some conversations that staff has had with a local land developer about the Unified Development Ordinance and how it treats accessory uses, such as ATMs, vending machines, um, things such as that. So staff looked at our code. We also looked at Fayetteville, the city of Fayetteville's code, and Kurtuck County. And we looked at those two specifically because they were drafted by Clarion Associates, the same firm that drafted our Unified Development Ordinance. And we pulled some information from those codes that we thought would be useful to be added to our code and help address some of the problems that we were seeing. We also worked closely with Chris, Mr. Chris Bailey from Bailey Associates, and we also got Ms. Patty Markle involved, who's the vice president of ATMs at Marine Federal Credit Union. 
So they have both seen this proposed text amendment. Um, they both have endorsed the changes that were made. They believe it will make it better for them. So one of the things that we would do with this proposal, if adopted, that you can find in attachment A, is we will create an ownership and operator exemption for things such as ATMs and vending machines. Right now, one of the accessory use standards says that you can have a principal use and you can have an accessory, but it's got to be owned and operated by the same people that run the primary use, the principal use. This would allow an exemption for things such as Coke machines or Pepsi machines, ATM machines, things of that nature. Redbox is real popular these days. The Redbox machine out in front of the CVS is not run by CVS. It's a different owner and operator. So this will create this exemption. Currently in the use table of accessory uses, our use table defines ATMs, but it's defined as a walk-up. We're just going to create a standard that's ATMs. It doesn't matter whether it's a drive-up or whether it's a walk-up. And we're going to revise the, the ATM definition as such. A new technology that's coming forward based on our conversations with Ms. Markle is a thing called an ITM, which is, uh, I believe it's an intelligent um, teller machine. And it's basically a video conference where you're speaking to a live teller at the ATM machine. So we went ahead and added that to the definition of ATM to include that. And one of the big issues that we ran into, and I'm going to show you an example of this, is with standard zoning, we all know of the front yard setback. So on the map here, I'm going to, or the aerial that I'm going to show you, this is an example using the, um, the Hobby Lobby as an example. If the Hobby Lobby has a 35-foot setback, which is what the corridor commercial zone has, basically it says anything built within this area is not allowed. So right off the bat, it could be no closer than that line. In the old way of zoning, you could then plop an ATM down right here in this corner. Well, our UDO doesn't allow that. The UDO also has a provision that we're proposing to eliminate, which is the front setback and the front yard. The front yard is defined as anything in front of the building. So that means an ATM would have to be placed somewhere behind that front line. We're proposing to eliminate that standard, which means now they can place an ATM somewhere out here in the front. If it's a walk-up, there's no stacking. What I mean by stacking is, is cars that are backing up. If it's a drive-up ATM for automobiles, we're worried about cars that may back up and cause a blockage for the people that are just trying to go through the parking lot or go from one site to the other. What's interesting is the UDO already had established a three-car stacking for an ATM machine but it didn't allow a drive-through ATM machine. So we're going to fix all that with this proposed amendment. So we believe, based on the items that we have prepared that you can find in attachment A, will address the concerns that were raised by, um, by Mr. Bailey and items that, upon looking at that information and looking at other codes, we believe would be beneficial to make the changes to our ordinance. And uh, Mr. Chris Bailey is here tonight. In case you have any questions, I'm going to put him on the spot, although that's why he's here. Um, be happy to answer any questions that the mayor and council may have about this unified text amendment. Council, any questions? Ron? Yes, sir. I don't have any questions. I have a comment. I just want to thank um, Richard and Ryan. You know, we often hear about how undeveloper friendly our community is, and I think this is a testament that we're not that, that we are developer friendly. and. That, you know, with the new UDO as complex as it is and, and, and situations come up and we get a chance to review them and, and, and look at it a little deeper, and as you all did, and, and you corrected a problem that arose, and I think you did it in a professional way, and I just want to thank you for doing that because, again, you looked at it objectively and, and it made sense and you, and you made it work out, and that makes us a developer-friendly community, and I just wanted to point that out. So thank you. Thank you. One question. Yes, sir. So the 35 feet, explain that again, what, what impact you had this has again? Okay, so an accessory use under historical zoning codes, you have a setback. Right. So if that setback is at 35 feet, which the quarter commercial zone has, other zoning districts may have greater or, or smaller setbacks, nothing can be built on the street side of that line. The UDO also referenced the front yard as well as the front setback. 
Well, the yard area is defined as anything between the street and the front wall of this building, which pushed all accessory uses behind that front wall. We are now going to go back to kind of the, the old school way of thinking, which is not the front yard, but the front setback. As long as it's behind that 35 foot setback line, stays. the setback stays. Now with the corridor commercial zone, a 35 foot is the standard that staff applies on an application base project. An applicant has the opportunity to submit a type two site plan and come to city council and that line could be reduced to as little as 10 feet, but that takes city council action. Any other questions? Thank you, Ryan. All right, thank you. This time on recess the regular council meeting, open up a public hearing in this matter that's required. And uh, I would uh, ask anyone that's present that wishes to speak on this matter, if you just indicate by raising your hand. I don't see anyone, so we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Council, you're being asked to consider the UDO, UDO text amendment. Mr. Mayor, I, I move that we approve the UDO text amendment found in attachment A regarding uh, accessory uses. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to agenda item number 12. This is a public hearing. Uh, on the Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment. This is an uh, amendment to Articles 3.8, Plan Development Districts, and Article 4.1, Use of Table for Mobile Home Parks and Subdivisions. And Ryan, uh, Ryan King will be presenting this item. Ryan. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, this next and third and final Unified Development Text Amendment that you're seeing tonight was actually submitted on behalf of Holiday City MHC LLC. Mr. Michael Douglas is here on behalf of that organization and his agent, Mr. Barton Lanier, is here as well. So if there's any questions that come up, um, they are here to speak on behalf of this as well. Over the past several months, uh, city staff, as in the previous item, city staff has worked with, closely with Mr. Lanier and Mr. Douglas to come up with some changes that we are recommending for a PDR text amendment. And what this would do is this would add as a permitted use within the PDR district, mobile home parks and subdivisions. And we've only had two other PDRs. This will be, or the, your next agenda item, if this is adopted, would be our third request. And basically what it boils down to is this allows an applicant to have a tailor-made zoning district. In order for that to happen, this text amendment first has to be adopted. So we would create standards for that allows the mobile home park subdivision or, um, or park within the PDR zone. And I gave a lot of background information in attachment A, but if you, if you look, the first change occurs under the PDR dimension standards. And we added a provision that allows city council to exempt the commercial requirement for PDRs greater than 35 acres for existing land uses. So if you've got an existing land use, they want to rezone to PDR and establish their own setbacks and the densities and things of that nature. Right now, the code says they would have to provide commercial within this development. If you've got an existing land use, there's no commercial established. This allows city council to consider that with the master plan that you'll see in the next agenda item. But we needed to create that, that ability for city council to consider that on a case by case basis, which we're proposing under the dimensional standards. And the next big changes you can find under the use table 4.1, PD districts are really set up so that a developer comes in and establishes their standards. Well, in our UDO, just like we kind of talked about with the previous agenda item, it said that you have to meet all the use specific standards plus have a master plan. Well, those are kind of, they work against each other potentially. So we are proposing an amendment to the language that basically says, those use specific standards can be applied, but if a developer provides a master plan that city council is willing to approve, those use specific standards can be incorporated or they may not be. It'll be up to city council to decide with each individual master plan based on what the developer gives you. So that's another part of the change that we're proposing. Uh, the use table, once again, there's quite a few pages associated with the use table, but there's really only one change, which is found under the household living. You can see MP is added under the PDR district. And those are the only changes needed to allow 
uh, a developer to come forth to city council with a master plan for a planned development residential unit for either a mobile home park subdivision, we have several of those here in town, or mobile home parks. We see this as an opportunity for mobile home parks to have an opportunity that they don't currently have today. And it, it will give them more flexibility when they come forth with their rezoning and master plan. Tonight, you're just gonna see both of them, this text first, and then you're gonna see the first master plan for a PDR, but it's gonna pave the way for any future uh, PDR rezoning request as well for this type of land use. Be happy to answer any questions that the mayor and council may have. Council, any questions for Mr. King? I have a question, Mr. King. So are you, we're basically just talking about land specifically used for mobile home parks, not intermingling with housing subdivisions. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. This ordinance would require, let's say that I have 100 acres and I want to develop a mobile home park or mobile home subdivision. I would have to come to city council and say I want to rezone this to a PDR for mobile home parks or mobile home subdivision mm -hmm. or any other use that allowed is allowed in, in, in a PDR district. And here's my plan. I'm going to have this many units. I'm going to have these setbacks. And here's my road network. Here's my master plan. And city council can consider that plan at the time of the rezoning. And if council has concerns, then you don't have to approve the rezoning. But this will not impact, you know, dropping in a manufactured home within existing zoning districts without having a rezoning and a master plan. So say, for instance, if we were to take a look at where the new Marine Federal Credit Union is on Western Boulevard, and that was a complete vacant land, but someone wanted to come in and put up a PDR, which is essentially next door to the commons. Would that be allowed? Is that, are we talking about that or are we talking about specifically having um, the PDR district not adjacent beside a existing housing development area? They would have to submit an application that would go through the rezoning process and have the planning board to give a recommendation to city council, city council consider that specific development plan, that master plan, at that location. So if it's a fit and council feels like that that meets the needs of the community, then you can approve the rezoning. If it doesn't fit within the, the plans and, and city council's desires, then you deny the request. It's not something that somebody can come in tomorrow and just do. It's gonna have to go through the rezoning process, the public hearing, City Council is going to have to bless that rezoning and the master plan mm -hmm. that identifies how they're going to lay that development out. And the constituents or the individuals in that neighborhood have a right to come forward and express their thoughts, concerns in terms of how this is going to affect their neighborhood. Like the next agenda item, we posted the newspaper ads, the signs, uh, the legal ads in accordance with the general statutes and our ordinance requirements. So that's correct. We would have to notify in accordance with those standards mailings in some cases, in most cases. But mobile homes is not a permitted use, is that correct? That's correct. <clears throat> Let me give you just a little bit more background. Uh, as, you learn in the next, as you learn in the next petition, uh, Holiday City Mobile Home Park existed before it was ever annexed into the city. Mm -hmm. Through the zoning conversions with the UDO, it became a non-conforming use. What that means as a non-conforming use, and I'm just going to make up some general numbers, but generally there are, let's say, 400 potential lots in there. As a non-conforming use, if any mobile home was moved out, a new mobile home could not be moved back in because you cannot do anything that expands or enlarges a non-conforming use. So let's say that someone, uh, the owner of the park, wanted to replace three units that were 20 years old. By taking them out, they have made it more conforming and they could not get permits to put three units back in. Not that they were going from 400 units to 410, but every time a unit came out, they simply lost a unit. The, as you'll hear in a minute on the next part of the, or the next petition, we have worked with Holiday City for probably four years to try to figure out 
how do we recognize the fact that they are providing a good housing product in a neighborhood where they have been accepted and we need to find a way to keep them modernized. So we first of all looked at setting up a uh, mobile home district. And we said, well, that, that's, that's fine if you're dealing with a completely vacant piece of property because then you can lay it all out, you know, 20 foot wide lot, 65 foot deep, whatever you want, just like any other subdivision. But because this area is in existence and it has what I'll call, if you pardon the expression, oddities, some lots are only 65 feet deep, some are other depths, you've got streets and so forth that are in private ownership, you've got different, the only way that we could find to create them as a conforming use so that they can continue and improve their subdivision is to change the text so that you can at least apply for a plan development residential dash mobile home. Our current UDO introduced the concept of plan developments. They're not automatic. It's a rezoning process. We have plan development commercial. We have plan development residential. We have plan development industrial. We did not have a category plan development mobile home. So the first thing you are asked to do is to modify the text so that it allows someone to apply. And that's what this first does. This does not, this first action does not do anything except establish the process that someone can ask for or go through. The next action, which is on your agenda, is the physical rezoning of Holiday City Mobile Home Park. That's no different than any rezoning to anything. So again, uh, I thought it was a good example that you used up at the, uh, on Western Boulevard at the Marine Federal. If the land behind Marine Federal is to be developed and it's not going to be developed as it's currently zoned, they have to go through the normal rezoning process. So that's really what this is all about, is trying to modify the code so that Holiday City has the ability to ask so that they can remove the non-conforming status and improve their area. Ryan, do you agree or disagree with what I said? When you say improve, Richard, are you, John, well, I, I think again, back to Ms. Washington, when you change a code, you just don't change it, as you know, clearer than I do for Holiday Mobile Home City. It's for citywide. Broad wide, mm -hmm. yeah. So, to your question, if the property is behind uh, Marine Federal, and they want to do a planned uh, unit development mobile home park, they could certainly apply to the city council, go through the uh, planning commission, and come to the council. And in your next agenda item, remember when there's rezonings, you have to find in the affirmative A through J, and then you, the council would do that. Remember, these are legislative functions. It's not like the quasi-judicial where, you know, you're kept to a little higher standard. But again, if they meet A through J, you would be required to rezone that. But that is a legislative decision, which means you have a lot more discretion than you do on the quasi-judicial. But it does, it would apply for anyone who wanted to come in for a rezone uh, for a planned unit development if they came in with their master plan, et cetera, and told you how they were going to buffer this, that, and the other. They, they could do that. You that that's correct. Okay, I guess what I was trying to seek more clarification, I guess in the past, if a uh, particular land was zoned for something specific and within the UDO it tailored what exactly could go there and if that particular land did not meet the specifics then the planning developer would have to require was it a special uses permit and come before council to have that type of dwelling to go on that land when originally it wasn't zoned for that well you can't get you can't get a special use permit anymore well, you can't get a special use permit to give you a use that's not allowed. Right. So, you know, for example, if you have a piece of property that's zoned commercial, you can put in there, and the, the normal commercial here is corridor commercial. That's what uh, you saw a few minutes ago 
on the uh, Western Boulevard examples. So if you have a vacant piece of property that's corridor commercial and you're going to put in a hardware store or a bank or a picture gallery or, 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 mm -hmm. Maybe Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thomas wants to go back into the dance studio business after <laughs> what we heard at workshop. As long as that's a permitted use in that zoning, he can simply go into it. If, however, let's say in the corridor commercial, you wanted to put in a, uh, an asphalt plant, mm -hmm. it's not a permitted use. You cannot get a special use. The only way you could put that asphalt plant there is for you as a city council to amend the code to specifically allow it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not comparing the mobile home park to the asphalt plant, but at the present time, the mobile home park does not have a home in any of our districts. There is no place in the UDO that a new mobile home park can go. And therefore, the, the matter that we find with Holiday City is the only way we can make them a conforming use rather than a non-conforming use is to find a category that they can apply for. The staff was not in favor of modifying any of the residential districts that exist today because we do not want from a staff, you have to decide from a legislative standpoint, we do not want to see mobile homes as infill products in conventional neighborhoods. So the only way that Holiday City can be moved out of the non-conforming category is for them to have a category they can apply for. And that's what this first action does, is it sets the category they can apply for. If you set this in the code, it doesn't automatically mean that you're agreeing to rezone the property. That moves you to the next agenda item. It also means, as you very correctly said, that once it's in the code, any piece of property can apply for it as long as it meets the standards. And some of those standards certainly are compatibility. So, Richard, what's the main difference between between what we have currently and what this does? We already have a they can already apply for a plan development here. No, actually, they can't because, because the it's way existing. Pardon me. Because it's existing. No, sir. But because the the plan unit development section of the UDO specifically talks about conventional housing and multiple family. It specifically does not mention mobile homes. So this would allow them to bring forward a plan development for review and negotiation, basically. Correct. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean it would be mobile homes. That is correct. Okay. I Thank you. Add one item of clarity. In the RSF 20, 20,000 square foot well, lots true. and 40,000, we do allow mobile homes with a special use. But that's a single home on a single lot. Because right. By law, we have to allow mobile homes within our jurisdiction. So, as a special just, use, that's correct. That's right. But this would be a different type of development than a single home on a single lot. Thank you, Mr. Willingham. I understand what the goal is. I just off what I've heard, just feel that this approach is a little broad. And you've mentioned changing uh, a district or creating a district for this area. Could you revisit that and tell me more why that is not recommended? If we had a zone for um, mobile homes and applied it to this area? Well, without being overly blunt, when we went through the UDO, you as a council specifically told us you did not want mobile home parks, you did not want mobile home subdivisions. Pretty clear. And knowing that that's what you told us, we are trying to find a way to take an existing mobile home park and create standards that are tighter. The, the plan unit development standards are much tighter than the conventional standards would be for a mobile home subdivision or mobile home park. And remember the difference. Mobile home subdivision is where the individual owns the lot. 
A mobile home park is where they either rent the lot and put their own unit on it, or they rent both the lot and the unit from the person who owns the whole park. But that's the reason why the UDO does not have any subdivisions, I'm sorry, any mobile home subdivisions or parks in there is because that's what you told us that you did not want. I absolutely understand that, and I was an advocate of that. But you're going to end up with one. If you had a district, and this was the district, you're not having them all over the city and in other zones. It would just be this one on this occasion. Yes, well, doesn't the, the developer have an opportunity to duplicate this somewhere else throughout the city? Not if Any, you just had this zone here. If you approve the planned development residential mobile home, any person can apply. The advantage of having this for Holiday City is they're allowed to write their own standards. You know, that doesn't mean you have to accept the standards. In a conventional mobile home subdivision or park, what you find is that every lot has to be 20 feet wide by 85 feet deep. It says the roads have to be this, the sidewalks have to be that. If we had that district today and you rezoned this park to a conventional zoning district, it would still be non-conforming. And the reason why it would be non-conforming is because, if you pardon the way I'm going to say it, and Mike, I hope I don't offend you, but this park is developed. It doesn't have lot lines. It's got mobile homes that are arranged as they are. So the only way, I mean, Barton Lanier is to be given a lot of credit. He and I wrestle for days and weeks on trying to figure how do you put something that's already developed into a mold that is as rigid as conventional zoning. If you, if you look at a conventional zoning district, and let's just take a single family district, you know that it says the lot 7,000 square feet. Now, I'm not talking about mobile homes. I'm just giving you an example. 7,000 square feet, front yard setback of 25 feet, side yard setback of 10 feet, <coughs> rear yard setback of 30 feet. Okay. If you're dealing with vacant property, that's great. Any engineer, well, let's say most engineers, can design a very good subdivision that meets those specifications. But when you're dealing with this park that already exists, and in some places, the lots, you know, can't meet those standards because the roads are not laid out perfectly aligned. And some of the blocks, if you pardon the expression, are kind of oval, while other blocks are rectangular. The only way that Barton and I could figure out how you even begin to make this thing work is to allow a PUD. Why a PUD? Because by the very nature of plan development rezoning is designed to give the property owner the maximum flexibility to design what that person needs on that piece of property. I will say to you again tonight, changing this rezoning and saying, no, we want it to be a mobile home subdivision or a mobile home park, it will not work for Holiday City. And if I can't add, either step would be a rezoning. Whether we create, because we did wrestle with that. We create a mobile home district or we create a PD. It's both going to be a legislative rezoning action. But one of the things, and I hope I don't open a can of worms with this, but one of the things I've heard on the radio is Greenville, North Carolina is dealing with these small homes. Basically, I don't know if they're park models, but really small homes. Somebody may want to develop a small home community in Jacksonville. A PDR is the way that they're going to be able to do it. But it's going to take city council approving that rezoning and changing all those dimensional standards and to get that density where they want it to be, or not where they want it to be, but where it's going to be with small homes on very small lots. It's a tool in the toolbox for them to be able to use that. Just like with this here, as Dr. Woodruff stated, all those roads are in place at Holiday City. To try to meet all the dimensional standards in a conventional zoning district, it's just difficult to do. And then the way that you know it is rotated in and out on a regular basis, the homes aren't the same width, they're not the same lengths. You know, markets 
change. So this would give them, you know, more flexibility. But either way would be a rezoning if we create a mobile home park district and add that to the code, and then they go through the rezoning. Or like we're doing tonight, change it to a PDR possibility, and then them come forth with a rezoning. It's really the same, six one half a dozen the other. So we just felt this was the most, and we've got several mobile home communities in, that are in the city that may be faced with the same situation. And at least this gives them a little bit, an additional tool that they don't have today with the standard dimensional standards, or the same dimensional standards. The one, it, the one advantage of this, on this piece of property versus others, most of the other neighborhoods where we have mobile homes, they're on individual lots. There is a minimum acreage in the PD. And it's required, I mean, this PD is being written where they cannot be sold off in lots. This is a rental park arrangement. So if, you're, if you have any concern that in some of the other areas, which I won't mention, but we've discussed, that this could be used, it'd be awfully difficult because those are individually owned properties and a plan unit development has a minimum size because it's supposed to be a plan development, not an individual lot development. It's a 10 acre minimum. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Ron. This time we're going to recess the regular council meeting and open require public hearing as to matter. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this? If so, raise your hand. I see no one. Close the public hearing. Councilor, you're being asked to uh, approve the uh, UDO text amendment. Mayor Phillips, I'll make the motion to approve the UDO text amendment found in attachment A. The amendment advances the public interest, creating more development opportunities and reducing non-conformities throughout the city. Sorry. Sorry. I have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to agenda item number 13, and this is a Holiday City Mobile Home uh, Community uh, rezoning from residential multifamily to low-density RMF. And uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Smith is going to be presenting this item. Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is the companion piece to follow up to uh, agenda item 12. This is a rezoning petition submitted by a Holiday City MHC LLC to rezone 61.32 acres found at 553 Corbin Street from residential multifamily low density and residential single family seven to planned development residential PDR. You'll notice the location on the vicinity map before you, Holiday City, which you know is Holiday City Mobile Home Park. This is aerial photography of the area. You'll notice um, the budding properties, and I'll go over their zoning. <clears throat> to the north is uh, Northeast Creek Park, City Park is uh, zoned RMF LD. Uh, across Corbin Street is another section of the park zoned RSF7. Residential multifamily high density uh, is across Corbin Street. To the south is undeveloped tract of zoned CC a church zoned RSF7 and then more undeveloped property to the east zoned RSF7. The purple hashed area is the city's flight path overlay. This property does fall within that. However, you will notice that with their terms and conditions found in attachment F, they are proposing 491 lots at 61 acres. That's a approximately a little over eight units per acre falling in the medium density classification and does not trigger any additional standards in the flight path overlay but we wanted to let you know that half of the property approximately half of the property was located in that flight path overlay the camel lane use plan identifies this as a split of medium density residential and low de density residential in the rear <coughs> the at a little over eight units per acre it falls within the mdr therefore the camel lane use supports the rezoning this is what the property along with the area would look as a large spot of PDR zoning. 
before you on the screen is the master plan that was submitted along with the terms and conditions found in attachment F in your agenda item. And I'll spend the next few slides going over the, the highlights of the terms and conditions. Uh, again, they are proposing 491 units. And these would be subject to their terms and conditions that they have submitted, that staff has reviewed and found what we believe acceptable. The principal uses would be manufactured homes, mobile homes, uh, single wide, double wide, or triple wide. And the common accessory uses found with a home uh, be decks, com the community building, and the offices that are located in the park, along with swimming pools, uh, the approximate uh, 4.6 acres of open space that they have for recreational use of the folks that live there, the maintenance buildings, the mail kiosks, et cetera. Setbacks they have proposed are the minimum, the street from the street is the MBL of 10 feet from any travel lane or right of way a minimum sideline distance of 18 feet from another manufactured home, and a minimum rear distance from another manufactured home of eight feet. Parking is at a ratio of one and a half unit spaces per manufactured home. Uh, at 491, uh, the parking space would require 737. However, they're currently providing 900 and not 989 spaces. Buffers to the north, east, and southern sides are remaining the same in their natural state. Um, I believe the northern that borders uh, Northeast Creek Park also has a Duke Energy transmission line going there that provides additional buffering with the park uh, traffic. However, the western side along Corbin Street, they are proposing a Class A buffer, uh, not at the traditional 30 foot wide, but at 15, 15 feet wide. Um, again, if you've reviewed the attachment F and have any questions with their remaining um, terms and conditions um, or the master plan, Mr. Mike Douglas, representing the owner, uh, Mr. Bartlett and his surveyors here, um, with staff would be happy to answer any questions. Um, with that being said, the Planning Advisory Board and staff have recommended approval with findings of fact A through J being found in the affirmative and that this rezoning would support that would um, provide logical development for the community. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Council, any questions of Mr. Smith? Any question, Mayor? All right. <clears throat> Richard, um, at, being that this is a planned development unit, as you called it, wouldn't there be um, more brought forward to us in terms of what is actually being placed? Are they the existing homes being rearranged in a certain way? What obligates uh, uh, this developer to complete this project. I know that when we looked at a planned development unit off of, I guess it was off of Western Extension, it was pretty comprehensive. There was timelines, there was uh, liabilities, there was, it was pretty significant. And that was kind of the concept. We're going to give you this, but then you're going to give us this back in a guarantee. How is this related? How do we know that this is going to be executed as presented tonight? Well, first of all, if you will notice on the graphic, this represents the as-built development. And what the text does, if you will look in the section that talks about maximum manufactured homes per block, what you'll notice is since this is a rental facility, there are no lot lines. So it's not, you can't think of this as being a conventional subdivision where you buy a lot. What you have established, and let's just look on the graphic here, let's look at block 12. What block 12 says is that it can have 39 manufactured homes. Now, that's the maximum that it can have. If they decide to put in triple wides, that number comes down to pick a number, 27. Right. But in putting in a triple wide, they still have to meet the front, sides, and rear setbacks. For each lot. Mm -hmm. For each, for each, each unit. unit. Right. Yeah, don't, no you, in this concept, you have to forget lots. I uh, you have to have to look at it from the standpoint I guess that what I'm in getting a, at is I always envision that these planned development agreements that we're involved with we we give and we get. Yeah. So what are we getting? Well, what you're getting 
is the fact that on every block, you know what the maximum number of units is that can be put in on that block. And that's it? No, wow. that, that's, that's not all you're getting. Okay. First thing you're getting is a maximum number for each block. And that's important because it allows mobile homes to be moved in or out, but it sets a cap. So, for example, you could have on, on that block 39 put in you may wind up with only 14 because if the developer decides that they're going to put in double wides instead of single wides, that's, that reduces the density. The second thing that you're getting from a public standpoint is the fact that you are getting the ability to replace aging units that are occupied with new units. Without the the rezoning, as right, we said before, wasn't the intent of the nonconformity to do away with that. I'm just playing the devil's advocate no, uh, here. Normally, nonconformities do that. I don't believe, though, that it was ever the city council's intent to make a a 400 unit mobile home park that was in one ownership nonconforming, because by staying nonconforming, it just ages out. Normally a non-conforming use is one use on a piece of property and you're saying over a reasonable time period that will go away. So I have to admit what you're not getting here are the things that you would normally get in a plan unit development that was brand new. You're, you're not getting new sidewalks, you're not getting, uh, you know, you're getting what's there and giving it the ability to live, if I can use that term. But this doesn't this doesn't preclude us later on. Say, like in this case, where Angela was talking about, where you get somebody wants to start a PDR somewhere else with mobile homes, doesn't mean that we can't require them at that point to do all these things, right? Sidewalks, and right? You're not yards. setting any standard right. here that can be applied to another piece of property that's vacant. Well, now, I mean that's an setting... important note because. Everything we're talking about contradicts what we were taught as a tool in the tool bag about plan unit development, that we can require things as what you're talking about, enhance pedestrian walkways, uh, other amenities for those plan unit developments in trade off for allowing certain things that normally wouldn't be allowed under a normal setting. That's correct. Am I and, correct? And everything you said is, is correct. If we were dealing with a vacant piece of property, and you may in the future be dealing with a vacant piece of property where someone wants to put in a planned development residential mobile home, you can require additional things, you can negotiate, you can say, no, in this area what we want is the following, and over here we want the following. In this one, you're simply negotiating on this piece of property as it exists today. But it does not require you to ever adopt on a vacant piece of property this exact same plan. Right. The PUD, when it was originally put into motion by the council back in 2007, 6, something like right that. there, this was for that Cypress Creek development that was going right. in over behind uh, where CVS is there at Gun Branch and uh, right. Western Boulevard Extension. And it was for new, you know, new development. And, and it basically, it was a combination of building that plus the annexation of gaining, you know, some kind of recompensation to the city for the services that would be brought out there. But like you say, this is brownfield. I mean, this is this is existing development that we're just dealing with here. So we're really not getting any new, giving any new service. We're not getting anything. So. <clears throat> That's pretty much it, right? It's, it's pretty much it. We're, it is what it is, and we're trying to find a way to, to help it improve. I guess that's the, that's the best testimony I can give to you. It's a stop. One of the, uh, the, the, the items that came up uh, during the planning board was the age of the units. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, you know, I think we were okay with, uh, with the planning board was okay with the 2,000 year or newer. Uh, and, and of course, we were 
there had to, you can't just stop at 200 to that the year 2000 because time's going to continue on I see you you've inserted 25 and I'm assuming staff's okay with the 25 That's right and we incorporated that change that the planning board recommended in there that no unit in there could be any older than the year 2000 and once we get past the year 2025 It'll, it'll start carrying up. So 2026 it can't be older than 2001, and it'll just keep proceeding like that. It can't be within that 25-year time span. 25. I guess my question then is: is um, we're at the year 2026, and he's got a, a 2000. Will he then automatically go in and replace all of the 2000s? I understand what you're saying. I, that was not no. discussed, I, but at the time no. that they want to replace it, it would have to be with a newer unit. Okay, no. so so you could leave older ones in there. You, you just no. cannot replace with anything. Right now, yes, sir. But they still have to meet minimum housing standards, right? Yes. And, so. I, and that's what I was going to ask is could we, instead of just arbitrarily picking a year, or, or maybe it wasn't arbitrary, maybe there were some, some modifications in the year 2000, is there any way of tying it to some sort of a building code that uh, updates that uh, the that the state building code would be adopted uh, with changes to the to the uh, manufactured home industry? Well, let me give you a let me give you a suggestion, and and you may want to ask the petitioner to come and and guide in this. In a plan unit development, you're negotiating obviously the terms. One of the things that we don't want is for this part to go backwards. So I believe the city attorney would, would need to chime in on this. I believe you could put in there that any unit, any replacement unit that is brought into the park cannot be older than five years from the day the permit is asked. Because remember, to move these units in and out, they still have to get building permits. I would, I would, I would rather see us say any unit brought in has to meet the current manufactured homes. If there's, if there is such a thing in the state building code, and I don't know that there is. Well, there are standards. I would, for I would think there would be, but I'm, I'm just saying it. To me, that would make more sense that any replacements would have to meet that standard. Can I, can I approach? Please do. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that I didn't meet, my name is Mike Douglas. I'm the work for the. For a Cynthia Real Estate Holdings Company, that's the company that bought Holiday City about four years ago. Um, and, and first, I'd like to say um, Jeremy, Ryan, Richard, and Barden uh, have worked, as Richard indicated, over. Se Barden and I have been working on it for several years to come up with a plan, this master plan that we're proposing, with the sole intent of the way Richard summed it up, with the sole intent of being able to improve an existing development that's already in the city. Mayor, it might be good to go ahead and recess and yes, get we into were just discussing yeah, that the public we're, hearing. We're ahead, uh, before you testimony. go further, let me uh, just recess the regular council meeting and open the public hearing in this. Now we'll go right on ahead. Yeah. We want to make it. I wanted to jump up here earlier, but legal. I wasn't sure if I should do right. that, if that was proper right. protocol. No, you're fine. Go right ahead. That's my fault. Uh, so, anyway, I want to thank uh, the planning department and Richard and Bard and all for their work because they've, uh, they, I think, have come up with a master plan that I think will guarantee the city that Holiday City will remain a viable source of affordable housing in the city uh, and will allow us to do what we do with our properties, which is constantly improve and upgrade them. And how we constantly improve and upgrade is by upgrading the, the manufactured housing, by upgrading the units. So before we ran into the snag about the nonconformity, we moved 10 units in. And I don't know if any of you have been to the property or not uh, in the last three years, but we bought brand new units in 2014, 10 brand new units. And these are high quality products. They're not trailers. They are manufactured homes that are built to HUD standards, and which means that they are actually inspected by HUD and approved by HUD. So to answer your question about the um, um, habitability and or standards in the mobile home industry, HUD is that authority. In 19, um, I think we touched on this in the 
uh, planning advisory board meeting that in 1978, HUD took over oversight of all manufactured housing development. Uh, not developments, but building, manufacturing. And so uh, the units that we buy, uh, either new or used, either way, are approved by HUD and meet this, the basic national standards for safety under, under those guidelines. So certainly that language, if you're comfortable with it, could be added. But what we talked about at the, at the uh, advisory board meeting uh, was, uh, as opposed to making it a year, our standard today in all of our properties is we will not move a home in, either our purchase or an owner-occupied home, we won't approve it to move into our property uh, unless it's 2000 or newer. That's our, our year today. But what we talked about was changing the language to 25 years or newer. We, or in other words, we wouldn't move anything in. We wouldn't allow anything to move into the property that was 25 years older than 25 years. Um, and if that, you know, satisfies... If that meets with your satisfaction, I mean, we can certainly add that to the language of this this uh, request or this plan. Absolutely, Mr. Carter. List of the number of units you have, approximately 400 out there. Uh, today we have uh, th roughly 360. And of those units, how many does your corporation own, and how many are privately owned? Um, right now, we've got a hundred and roughly 130 that we own. Uh, so uh, what? Two, uh, another hundred or two hundred and thirty that are privately owned. Okay. Uh, the other question: the HUD regulates the each year. Do those standards uh, change on a frequent basis as far as uh, special uh, additional fire requirements in these homes, et cetera? I mean, they change on a regular basis, don't they? They they upgrade them fairly regularly. I would say at least every two or three years they're reviewed. And then manufacturers are uh, passed down, or, or how can I say it? HUD assigns those new regulations to the manufacturers who are building the homes. So my point to council would be a couple. Number one, they don't even own the majority of the homes there, so there's going to be individuals who are going to be wanting to upgrade. Number two, that uh, to put up to today's HUD standards, well, yesterday's mobile home may not meet that. It's got to be something that, as Richard said, if they have to come in and get a permit, which I presume is all correct, that is something your, your staff can administer in a fair and equitable manner. Uh, and that would be my point. Mike, let me ask you this, uh, Councilor, if I may. I have to be quite honest with you. I've been supportive. I'm not supportive of a 25-year-old mobile home moving in. Is there is there a... Uh, is there a newer number? I mean, uh, I'm certainly not suggesting that mobile homes are not quality. But I do know in single-family developments, 25 years, things can be pretty worn out just in conventional stick-built development. Is there a number such as 10 years that you would be willing to commit to? I mean, the, the HUD standards are going to force a 25-year-old or a 22-year-old mobile home is not going to meet the HUD, the HUD standards. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, I wouldn't agree with that. It, it will meet HUD standards. Won't meet the current. Yeah. <clears throat> won't meet the current HUD standards. It may not meet. If you bring a 24-year-old unit in, it may be four, five, six, seven HUD standards that it's that it lags behind. If uh, it, my, my argument on this would be. If we're going to permit a, a home to be built in Phil or anywhere else in town, it has to meet the current state building codes. Correct. Uh, maybe, maybe saying that it has to meet the current HUD standards may be a little strict in this thing, but I certainly I don't think I, I want to recommend that we allow a 24-year-old unit, 24 years and 11 months be brought in, that, that may be several upgrades in HUD standards behind. Yeah, that's the point. That's, that's the point I'm asking is, you know, if we, it's one thing, obviously when it was built, it met standards. Correct. But, you know, either something that says that the unit can only be brought in if it meets today's HUD standards, because the goal that we have here is to help the park move forward. Correct. Not stay status quo, not increase the number, 
the goal we have here is so that the units that are there are units that that continue to be quality, not worn out. If and, you pardon and, the blunt, and safe Absolutely. during safe during our hurricane storm seasons. So uh, that's why we have building codes because of those issues. But I, I would point out that 230 of these are owned by the people. These are not folks that are very affluent, in my thought. You are, may, by boxing them into today's HUD standard, these folks may never be able to move that mobile home out. They'll have to live there in a, a rat hole, if you will, because they can never get to that standard. It's a balancing act here. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll buy into that argument. I, and that's I, all I'll, I would I'll say. agree a little bit on but, that, but I think 25 is a little... Yeah. A little too too old, in my, in my my opinion, in my personal opinion. And I have a question in regards to the privately owned, which um, the he was talking about. How how does the privately owned units? Uh, how are they affected in this plan? They would have to abide by the plan. In other words, he would not be allowed. If I was an owner there, I wouldn't be able to, allowed to move a new mobile home in or any kind of mobile home unless I could get it permitted in accordance with this PDR. So I'd have to meet every, whatever requirement the council places on it as far as its newness, if you will. Remember, he owns the land. Right. You know, I mean, the, the, what we're talking about, obviously, is land use restrictions. And John is certainly right that, uh, that a unit that's there that's in private ownership is, quote, unquote, grandfathered in as far as the unit itself. Anything that's going to be moved in, though, is going to have to meet whatever standards. Uh, again, I, I am not supportive. I'm very supportive of the concept. I'm not supportive, though, of the flexibility that would allow older mobile homes to be brought in. Now, whatever the reason, one of the nice things about a planned unit development is you're able to negotiate with the, with the developer. One, one moment. And brought back, I would recommend that we table it or do a place, right? Compromise you're willing to offer the council on this position. Yeah, but first, uh, let me uh, address a couple of things that have been said. Um, um, Mr. Warden, your point was actually. Uh, correct to some degree that, uh, yes, HUD does change its standards on a fairly regular basis, three, five years, the, you know, new standards will come out. The majority of those standards that they're changing today are not relative to safety. They're, they're relative to energy efficiency. I mean, that's the, the primary reason for changes and upgrades in HUD's code and in their uh, manufacturing criteria for mobile homes today. Safety, so, safety and comfort are, are almost uh, twins of each other, I mean, to some extent. To some extent, but the safety issue, the habitability is the most important. I think it's the most critical one, actually. Most especially, I mean, in essence, you know, I mean, think about it in this context. So you're right, a 25-year-old home, no one's going to build on a new development or on a site a 25-year-old home. But if a 25-year-old home is sold, it's sold and it's habitable. And unless it's inspected and there's issues found within that home that would create a safety issue, older, non-efficient windows are not considered uh, eliminating factors for that home to be sold and lived in. Council, let me that's ask not you what this. we're talking about. Maybe here. the best thing for but us to we're do. We're talking about replacement. I'm not talking about you allowed to, you know, being allowed to move another tenant into an existing home. I'm talking about if you had to replace that unit. Correct. And so to that point, the point that was made about the owner occupants who are there now, when their homes expire or become obsolete, they have the opportunity to go out in the market and purchase a used home. We have the opportunity and almost exclusively buy brand new homes. So in 2017, if we want to move 20 homes in, it'll be 20 brand new homes that are just coming off the line at the manufacturer. But if a owner who lives there now lives in a 1967, you know, single wide home uh, and that home is deemed, they want to upgrade. Let's just say they want to upgrade um, and they want to upgrade to a 2000. And today is 2017. Are, are we going to tell them that they can't buy a 2000 home, which is a significant upgrade for them to move into that park? 
I mean, that's that's Mayor, the obstacle, Mayor, not so much with us, but that's the obstacle that, that they would have to be able to overcome. Just a second, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I, I would suggest that uh, usually the the best contract or the best terms are never negotiated like we're trying to do it now. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I would to to, uh, to just recess the public hearing and until your next meeting uh, a month from now, let the manager and Mr. Douglas and whoever work out the details, work out the details yes, and we'll bring it back. We won't have to be any other public notice or anything of Let's that nature. Let's do that. We're going to recess the public hearing in this matter. Uh, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. Well, I just know that's fine. I'll, 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 I'll say it when I'll you were, recess. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'll say it when we go back. All right. Um, and we need to table the... We're going to go ahead and make a motion to table this until uh, the, uh, the, the, next, the regular meeting, in, uh, which is the second meeting in March. Okay. That's my motion. <clears throat> is that a sufficient amount of time to get details worked well, out on this? Yes, sir. <laughs> It'll either be worked out or it won't. <laughs> Good enough. Is that, uh, did, did you have some comment? No. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Comment. No, I just. Well, no, I'll talk to you. What we would ask is. Let's get a vote on it, unless you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No, okay. All opposed? Now, Dr. Blair. If there are any other items that you'd like for us to negotiate during this period of, uh, of it being tabled, please let us know in the next several days. Yes, sir. Thank you. That sounds like, like a, that sounds like like a fair uh, request. Basically. All right. Right. So we'll, we'll get back together on this I mean, and try to figure this thing out. We got it halfway done, right? Or half, half of what they wanted. All right, so now we come to our section of uh, reports for the evening. And uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Willingham. No report. Mr. Bittner. Just a comment about last night's joint meeting with the city and the county. Hats off to those who arranged the meeting, the mayors and managers. It's the first meeting we've had with the county in I don't know how many years. And it's rather propitious that since there were three new con county commissioners that we got a chance to meet in a formal setting and more importantly to discuss common issues that affect both of us. It's through meetings like that and I hope future meetings that we can continue to work on problems that are common to us and hopefully come up with common solutions too as well. So again, kudos for arranging the meeting and the success it had. That's it. Okay. Mr. Missouri. No report. Thank you. Um, again, I echo what you said about the meeting uh, last night. I thought it was very productive. It was uh, a good work. Uh, I think we're going to have a good relationship there and work together. I also want to uh, publicly congratulate my partner over here for, <laughs> for being uh, uh, recognized as one of the 10 uh, intriguing African-American women at Saturday night's banquet. Very proud of that. Um, uh, my comment is that um, last night, well, Saturday night occasion could not have happened happened without one of our young, um, one of our heroes who has now crossed over and gone on to be with the Lord. So I really, truly, indeed miss my friend Oliver Hill and all of the wonderful things that he has done for Jacksonville and Onslow County. So um, just keep his family in prayers. Indeed. Uh, no report. Thank you. Proud to be here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I'm proud to have you here. Dr. Woodruff. Council. I know that you're aware of this, but I'd like to make the public aware. Reginald Goodson will be retiring the 28th day of February, meaning next week. He has served the city long and well for 12 years as the Development Services Director. Although I haven't had the privilege of working with Reggie for those entire years, I can say unequivocally that the leadership that he has given helped adopt the UDO, it also has helped with quality development throughout Western Boulevard and throughout the city. He has directed the planning, building, codes, and CD. If you look at the progress that Lily and her folks have made by tearing down now over 100 residential structures, Reggie's hand was in that. 
if you look at the improvements that we've had in commercial and residential development and new subdivisions, Reggie had a hand in that. A lot of things, you know, as we all move on in our careers, a lot of people don't realize the impact that an individual has. He will be missed. And I would like to publicly commend him. On Friday of this week, uh, the staff will be taking him out to lunch. I believe that's at Logan's at noon. And if any of you would like to join, feel free to. We tried to book Lazaro's, <laughs> but the problem is they only seat 4,000 at Lazaro's, and we expect more. But again, I do want to publicly thank Reggie. He will be retiring and moving back to his home in the Raleigh area. As always, I do thank you, Mayor, and you members of the City Council for your leadership and what you do for this community. Thank you very much. Mr. Carter, no report, Mayor. Thank you. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Not even going to answer. <laughs>